The Old Testament lesson for today is Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 12 through 26. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the one do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise have eyes in their head, but fools walk in darkness. Yet I perceived that the same fate befalls all of them. Then I said to myself, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said to myself that this also is vanity, for there is no enduring remembrance of the wise or of fools, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. How can the wise die just like fools? So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair, concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and heaping, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a chasing after wind. The gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We live in an age of complex and overlapping threats. Monsters, we might call them. Any one of them could fundamentally change life as we know it, as COVID did in 2020, as 9-11 did in 2001, or as life in Israel changed just this past Saturday morning. But having more than one occurring at the same time, as we now do, has the capacity to shut down all the gifts God has given us to address them as we cower in fear of the very real harm that each threat represents. In every age, society, and culture, one of the coping mechanisms for dealing with existential threats has been the creation of a lore of monsters, 
which includes not just advice on how to avoid or survive encountering monsters, but also ways in which they can be successfully overcome. While the monsters created by any given culture have some differing characteristics, including whether the threats they represent are real or imagined, there are some basics that all monsters share. They are all an existential threat to human beings. We can see that today just in the way we use monster as an adjective. A storm is just a storm, and it might even be fun to sit on your porch and watch it. But a monster storm? You put that adjective in front of it, and everyone knows what it means. It is life-threatening. The stories of monsters are the stories of our most basic fears and desires, sometimes projected out onto others, sometimes turned inward upon ourselves, and sometimes created out of whole cloth in a legendary or fictional creature. Monsters are always huge, showing how small we feel in comparison to the monster's power. Although the specific monsters change according to the threats perceived in any one time or place, the concept of monsters is universal. And that includes in the church. The church has always grappled with monsters, from gargoyles on medieval cathedrals to the monsters described in the Bible, to the early church fathers debating whether God preordained the severe deformities in humans and animals that their age labeled as monstrous. So as we look at the monsters of our age across these next weeks, whether those monsters are real, imagined, or projected, our most important question will be what guidance our Christian faith gives us when confronting them. As we kick this off this morning, I want to set the broader context of our human condition. More specifically, the context of our faith condition as imperfect mortals trying to live a life that's true to the teachings of Jesus in a world that seems bent on doing the exact opposite, a life that has a different kind of meaning than our culture would generally label as the good life. The choir anthem this morning, which comes from the score of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films, will lay out the hope for how the difficult life of faith might play out as it squares against life's darkest moments. The song begins, May it be an evening star shines down upon you. May it be when darkness falls, your heart will be true. You walk a lonely road. Oh, how far you are from home. And so we're going to travel that lonely road to 6th century Scandinavia, where Beowulf, a local hero of the people in what is now southern Sweden, receives a call from help for help from the Danish king. What is rotten in the state of Denmark is Grendel, an ogre who can't stand the music, feasting, and joy of the king's lively hall. Once the torches are extinguished for the night, Grendel comes into the hall and makes his own feast out of the king's guests. The nightly gruesome demise of your guests at the hand of a monster can do a number on the king's polling numbers and he is in need of a hero to vanquish Grendel. Beowulf, young and strong and already a proven hero to his own people, heads to Denmark to help the Danish king and save his people. Beowulf dispatches Grendel with his bare hands. But almost immediately, Grendel's mother, who's an even more menacing monster than her son, shows up to take revenge. Beowulf has an epic chase to her lair at the bottom of a lake before he kills her with a sword that he finds in her den. Those are the opening plot points of an ancient Anglo-Saxon poem titled Beowulf, after the story's hero. And here I would like to bring in one of my favorite literary critics into the conversation. The Oxford Don, devout Christian, creator of the Elvish language, and Lord of the Rings author J.R.R. R. Tolkien. The title for this morning's sermon, Until the Dragon Comes, comes from the very last line of a 1936 lecture by Tolkien about Beowulf, the poem. 
The subtitle of the lecture is The Monsters and the Critics. And Tolkien's purpose was to take on the many literary critics of Beowulf who panned the poem because, as Tolkien sums up their critiques, its weakness lies in placing the unimportant things at the center and the important on the outer edges. For both literary critics and those who have since made movies from the poem, the important things are the hero Beowulf's battles with monsters. I've told you about two of those battles with Grendel and his mother, but there is one more. After those youthful acts of heroism, Beowulf returns home where his people make him king and he enjoys a 50 year reign of peace in his lands. However, in his advanced age, Beowulf learns that someone in his court has been stupid enough to steal a golden cup from a dragon's hoard. If you are not versed in the dragon lore of the West, Stealing anything from the horde of a dragon is a really, really, really bad idea because dragons, you know, they like their stuff, even though the dragons themselves got their hordes of gold from stealing from other people. Some contemporary examples might come to your mind. But in any case, the fire-breathing dragon comes to exact revenge on Beowulf and his people for the theft of the cup. Knowing that he will likely die in the attempt, Beowulf goes out one last time to fight the monster. He's not only quite old at this point, but he's been abandoned by all but one of his retainers. Between the two of them, they manage to kill the dragon, but not before Beowulf is mortally wounded. Beowulf dies and is buried, and that's the end of Beowulf, both man and poem. The critics Tolkien is addressing believe Beowulf's his heroic battles with Grendel and his mother at the beginning and with the dragon at the end are the important things and object to the fact that all that action takes up only a couple hundred lines of the 3,182 lines in the poem. The vast middle of the poem is celebrating the 50 year reign of Beowulf over his peaceful kingdom with his minstrels singing his praises. A waste of space, said the critics. The time should have been spent on the monsters, the important things, you know. Tolkien's counterpoint is that the important thing in the poem is exactly that middle, because that middle is where most of life happens both for Beowulf and for us. As John Lennon sang in Beautiful Boy, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Tolkien would add that life is what happens when the dragon, until the dragon comes. As Tolkien describes the poem's theme in his lecture, he says, and I quote, it glimpses the cosmic and moves with the thought of all men concerning the fate of human life and efforts. It stands amid but above the petty wars of princes and surpasses the dates and limits of historical periods, however important. At the beginning and during its process, and most of all at the end, we look down as if from a visionary height upon the house of man in the valley of the world. Of the monsters in the poem, Tolkien says, Nowhere does a dragon come in so precisely where he should. Triumph over the lesser and more nearly human is canceled by defeat before the older and more elemental. The placing of the dragon is inevitable. A man can but die upon his death day. In the church, that's the whole point of Ash Wednesday. And it's the context for our lives. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return, whether by the sudden fiery breath of the dragon or by the slow grinding of earth. While Tolkien's lecture doesn't address it, I think it's also the theme addressed by both of our scripture lessons this morning. The book of Ecclesiastes is believed to represent the teaching of King Solomon who was considered the wisest of Israel's kings. 
Most of Ecclesiastes is written as if by Solomon's own hand. Although we best remember Ecclesiastes from the poem in chapter three that begins, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Most of the book has the kind of nihilistic mood that you heard in the reading. King Solomon is expressing what many of the world's rich and famous come to realize. I have it all, but what now? In the end, it's all going to be gone. So what if I'm wise? A fool will come along and undo whatever my wisdom has achieved. Solomon asks, how can the wise die just like fools? And yet, here we are. We live our lives until the dragon comes. That is the human condition, all of us. Solomon returns again and again to the phrase, this is vanity. The Hebrew word translated as vanity in Ecclesiastes is the word for vapor, like the vapor of a breath. It's not the more spiritually oriented word ruach, which means wind, breath, or spirit, like the spirit of God hovering over the waters at creation. This word is hevel, which is the transitory vapor of the actual human breath. Breathing just once isn't going to cut it. If you want to keep on living, you have to keep on breathing. The hevel, the vapor breath, is only good for right now. You can't save it for later, much as we often try. When Ecclesiastes says something is vanity, it's emphasizing that whatever it is doesn't last. It's fleeting. You have you have the thing only until the dragon comes. While most of Ecclesiastes makes that very same point over and over, I chose the particular part I did this morning because of verse 24, where Solomon decides that since it's all vanity, and quote, there is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. Those verses catch my attention because Jesus appears to step up to consider that very same issue in the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12. The rich fool is speaking here as I quote from verse 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. I don't know for sure that Jesus was thinking about King Solomon's almost identical words in Ecclesiastes there, but Jesus mentions Solomon a mere eight verses later when he says of the lilies of the field that even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. There are other parallels to Solomon too. King Solomon was known for three basic things, his wisdom, his vast wealth, and his building projects. The most famous of the latter was the temple in Jerusalem, but he also built extravagant palaces, storage facilities, and projects of many kinds across Israel. Jesus, as a rabbi, would have been well acquainted with both King Solomon and the book of Ecclesiastes, and it seems hard to believe that he could talk about a rich man who focused on building ever bigger barns to hold all his stuff, and whose attitude is almost a direct quote from Ecclesiastes without thinking of King Solomon. If so, that adds some punch when Jesus follows that quote about eat, drink, and be merry from the wise King Solomon with verse 20 in Luke 12. You fool! <laughs> This very night, your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Last fall, we looked at this section of Luke and how the parable of the rich fool helps to set the context for Jesus' teaching to his disciples in the passage that follows, which is often referred to as the lilies of the field. The point of those next verses about the lilies and such is that disciples of Jesus should not hoard wealth, but should instead rely on God's provision, like the rest of the natural world does, the ravens, the lilies, the grasses of the field. 
the parable of the rich fool and the passage about the lilies of the field go together, even if your Bible might have interrupted it with some other subject heading that's not in the original text. They just flow one to another. Jesus even points out that the grass is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven. But God cares for that grass all the same. In other words, yes, it is all vanity. It's all vapor. The wise and the fool, the rich and the poor meet the same end on the day the dragon comes. The things that you have prepared, whose will they be? The Beowulf poet, Tolkien, Solomon, and Jesus all agree that in this life, we are all waiting for the inevitable day that the dragon comes. Hero, king, commander, ravens, lilies, grass, we will all be consumed by the same fiery breath. It is, in many ways, the ultimate monster. And like the critics of Beowulf that Tolkien confronted, many think that that fact makes the vast middle of our lives of little consequence. Vanity, mere vapor, good only for grasping and consuming as much as we can, whether it's information or things, and act like those are somehow important and lasting or at least fun. Eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus teaches that such efforts are foolish. That's not what the wise do when they know a dragon is on the way. The Beowulf poet, Beowulf himself, and Jesus all celebrated living a life of giving to others. Sell your possessions and give alms, says Jesus in Luke 12. Strive for God's kingdom and the rest will be given to you. Beowulf the hero began by risking his life to save a different people, the Danish kingdom, and then went home to his own to provide peace for his own lands. His people celebrated that gift for almost 3,000 lines of poetry. When the dragon came, even though he knew it would end his life, Beowulf went out to defeat it. He gave his life to save his kingdom, with only one of his men willing to go with him. By the time Frodo got to the fires of Mount Doom to save Middle Earth, only Sam was still with him. By the time the nails were driven into Jesus' hands and feet, John was the only one of his 12 disciples who remained with him as the world grew dark and eclipsed the sun. Monsters are the things that go bump in the night. They are the threat that we feel in the dark. The offering of Christian faith is that it is in that very dark where the promise lies. It is in letting go that we gain all things. It is in the dark earth that the seed sprouts. It is from the dark tomb that the light of resurrection breaks forth. But still we find ourselves afraid. How do we live our lives in the shadow of what will come? Is it all just vanity, a chasing after wind? Should we just eat, drink, and be merry until the fire rains down upon us? How do we find our purpose and our courage when the road is lonely and we are far from home? The choir anthem this morning has an answer. The refrain states the threat in Elvish, the language that Tolkien invented, and then offers a hopeful response in English. Mornie utulie, the darkness comes. Believe, and you will find your way. Mornie elantie, the darkness falls. The promise lives within you now. The kingdom of God is within you, said Jesus. All the wisdom, all the riches, all the power, those things are vanity a vapor easily blown away. Only fools try to grasp and store them. But the promise, the kingdom, lies within us. 
The anthem prays that when the darkness falls, it will find in us a true heart, which will propel our journey on to light the day so that when the night is overcome, we may rise to find the sun. The promise lives within you, within us, now. Amen. Thank you.